and it's Ms. Siddiqui here. In this video, we will talk about the developments that have taken place in the Scarlet Letter from chapters 9 through 12. So chapter 9 of the Scarlet Letter is entitled The Leech. Now this title has a double meaning. Um, a leech was the name for an old doctor because back um, in the time period of the Puritans, um, leeching someone was one of the ways that um, doctors provided care for patients. So they actually believed that if you were sick, that there was something um, kind of bad in your blood. And if they were able to draw it out, either by bleeding you, like cutting you and letting the blood out, um, or actually using leeches to suck out the blood since they're parasites, that that would somehow cure um, the patient. Now, leech also obviously has a negative meaning, like a leech is somebody who like sucks the life out of you, um, is this really sort of like gross, black, negative um, creature. So this double meaning, the leech, um, refers to both the fact that Chillingworth is a doctor, but also that he's kind of sucking the life out of Dimsdale, which we see um, progress through these couple of chapters. Um, so in this chapter, we find out um, that Dimsdale and Chillingworth are getting to know each other really well, and in fact, they're living in the same space. Um, they have separate apartments, but in the same house. And so the townspeople um, initially kind of really like this special relationship between Chillingworth and Dimsdale. It's nice to see, you know, they really wanted a doctor for their town, um, and then also they have this beloved minister, so they're great. They're happy to see this kind of friendship blooming between them. Um, but slowly, the townspeople kind of become suspicious of Chillingworth. Um, they can tell that Dimsdale's just getting sicker, um, that there's a sort of negative relationship between them. And Hawthorne writes kind of very explicitly that since living with um, Dimsdale, Chillingworth has become darker and more hideous. Um, and he writes, now there was something ugly and evil in his face. And he doesn't just mean literally ugly, because we know, you know, Chillingworth was ugly and old. Um, he even says that when he talks to Hester in chapter 4. But this is sort of something darker, something about his spirit being kind of polluted. Um, so in this chapter, we realize that for Dimsdale, the relationship with Chillingworth is um, dangerous. And we see this kind of contrast between Chillingworth and Dimsdale. And the town itself is fascinated by um, the minister in the company of a man of science. And in this chapter, we see there's a sort of satanic turn in Chillingworth's character. Um, Hawthorne even writes, Chillingworth kills his old self and withdraws his name from the role of mankind. So that's kind of both referring to the fact that Chillingworth um, came here, you know, got uh, shipwrecked, lived with the natives for a while, was wandering around, and then, like, developed a new identity in this town, but also the fact that he's kind of just so obsessed with getting this revenge that he's not even, like, a real person who's functioning and living and has other desires. He's almost just so polluted by his vengeance scheme. Um, so, and also... Um, Hawthorne writes of Chillingworth, he resolved not to be pilloried beside her on her pedestal of shame. Why come forward to an inheritance so little desirable? So you can imagine in Chillingworth's shoes, like you've been gone for two years, you've had a really rough time being with the natives, like haven't been getting to where you wanted to be in this colony, and then you get there and you see your wife, um, who has a child that you know is not yours because you weren't there, and you're just sort of like, what are you supposed to do? So it's, in a way, understandable how Chillingworth, um, you know, has fallen into this kind of dark state, but he really takes it to this almost devilish extreme um, in these next few chapters. Um, so in chapter 10, um, the chapter is called The Leech and His Patient. So if you haven't figured it out yet, the leech is Chillingworth, and his patient would be Dimsdale. Now this chapter focuses on the relationship between the two of them. And this chapter, Chillingworth is obsessed with discovering the truth. And what's also interesting about this chapter is that as he becomes more obsessed with the truth, Dimsdale gets sicker and sicker. He's described as being pale. Um, he's like always clutching his heart. He feels this heaviness um, in his heart, which we know is about the sin, but others think that um, he 
might be sick or that he's like carrying some sins of the town. So um, Chillingworth, though, kind of knows a little bit be better and he recognizes that there's like this, some sort of like psychosomatic thing going on here where Dimsdale must be carrying some huge burden. Um, and so Chillingworth is sort of like telling Dimsdale, you know, a man should be, should be, um, um, confessing, you know, what he's done so that he can feel lighter. And um, Chillingworth even talks about, like, these different stories of men on their deathbed who, you know, once they told the secret to the doctors or to everybody, they were able to, like, be free and go to the light and be with God. And so Chillingworth is sort of manipulating Dimsdale and trying to get him to confess. Um, and Chillingworth asks, you know, why should a man um, be willing to carry secret sins to the grave rather than confess them during his lifetime? And Dimsdale replies that most men do confess, but some men do not because they would no longer be able to do God's work on earth. So Dimsdale knows what it would mean to confess this secret, and he does not want to um, kind of lose his ability to do God's work as a minister. Um, and in Chillingworth, in this chapter... Um, Hawthorne describes him as with purpose to steal the very treasure this man guards. And in this chapter, there's like tons of imagery about hearts and secrets. And Chillingworth is continually encouraging Dimsdale to reveal secrets um, and disclose and free his heart. Um, so at the end of the chapter, um, Chillingworth and Dimsdale see Hester and Pearl like outside, and Pearl is literally dancing on a grave. And Chillingworth kind of looks judgmentally upon the child, thinking like, oh, here's this little devil child. And Dimsdale says, she has the freedom of broken law. Now, from here, we can see that Dimsdale maybe in some way envies Pearl's um, ability to be free. So like, because she... Um, is not viewed as pure. She doesn't have to carry this burden of it. Um, and what's interesting in this chapter is that Pearl and Hester have a conversation, and Pearl says to Hester, look, um, you know, a black man got hold of the minister. And she doesn't mean, like, Chillingworth is African-American, of course. She means that um, this black man, this man who is devil-like, um, has gotten hold of the minister. So there's this weird kind of power dynamic between Chillingworth and Dimsdale that everybody, including Hester and Pearl, can observe. And so again, at the end of this chapter, um, we have this weird moment where Chillingworth finds Dimsdale asleep in his chair. He pulls up his shirt and finds this letter A carved into the skin. And Chillingworth, like, is described as having this look of, like, wonder and horror and joy. And he kind of dances around the room in this, like, devil-like way. And so we really see in this chapter where Chillingworth has just totally lost it. Um, and he's going to be, like, obsessed with, um, you know, outing Dimsdale. Or we not, we're not really sure what he's going to do. But now he really seems to know, you know, this is the guy. Um, so Chillingworth becomes diabolical in his determination. Um, we see this vicious side of him. Um, Ch so Chillingworth in this chapter is a victim of his need to seek the truth, and Dimsdale is a victim of his own weakness of not being able to cons uh, confess his sin, and Dimsdale is also consumed with this painful inner suffering. Um, but actually what's interesting is that the town really sees this inner suffering as like this really great quality of Dimsdale. So when Dimsdale says things about himself, um, that are negative, the town is like, oh, you know, he is so worthy of our praise because he, you know, he is so critical of himself, but little do they know that he actually is worthy of critique. Um, so chapter 11 is called Interior of a Heart. And so in this chapter, Chillingworth kind of just begins his torture of Dimsdale. He knows, um, he knows the secret. And um, Dimsdale is really resistant. He says, you know, I'm not going to tell an earthly physician, um, you know, what's between me and God. Um, and Dimsdale kind of tolerates Chillingworth um, because he sort of thinks that maybe his dis dislike stems from his own impure heart. Um, and through this chapter, Dimsdale becomes more popular among the congregation. The fact that Dimsdale is suffering allows him to um, sympathize with the sin and suffering of others. So he actually ends up being a better minister as a result of um, this indiscretion. And um, Chillingworth 
as described by Hawthorne as beginning to plot a, quote, more intimate revenge than any mortal had ever wreaked upon an enemy. I love that line. And it's just, it's very true because he he's in close quarters with him. There's this sort of weird dynamic, but there's still some trust and nobody knows who Chillingworth is. Um, and then actually in this chapter, the narrator remarks that the town might have actually forgiven Dimsdale at this point, like because he is such a well-liked minister um, and he's like clearly... Um, able to navigate his congregation in a way that, like, he is sympathetic and empathetic, um, that the town might have let Dimsdale off the hook. Um, so in this chapter, we also find out that Dimsdale engages in um, self-flagellation, which is basically he, like, um, beats his own body. Um, and he, and this is basically... Um, Dimsdale does this because he thinks it would be necessary for his salvation to punish himself for um, what he's done. And um, he also takes, like, walks around the house at night. Um, so in this chapter, um, we have this kind of futile attempt at public confession that Dimsdale makes. Um, and we have this irony with that, which is that the more that Dimsdale asserts his own sinf sinfulness, the holier his congregation believes him to be. Um, so in chapter 12, um, this is called the minister's vigil, Dimsdale goes out into the night and actually stands on the scaffold by himself and nobody notices. I think there's like an old man that looks out, but he doesn't see you know, or like walks by and doesn't even notice. Um, and so Dimsdale standing there, like, realizing the mockery of his standing safe and unseen where he should have stood seven years ago before the townspeople with Hester, um, Dimsdale is just kind of overcome by self-abhorrence and, like, shrieks out loud. And again, nobody hears, which again is this sort of idea that nobody sees Dimsdale sin, and yet Hester walks around in daylight, stands on the scaffold wearing this A, every day and um so there are two people that do notice and that's hester and pearl i wrote pearly oops um so hester and pearl come upon him in the night and the three of them stand on the scaffold together and in this scene um you know dimsdale tells pearl who repeatedly asks like stand you know stand with us dimsdale says he cannot stand with them on the scaffold um the next day but he will stand with them on judgment day um, and actually, creepily in this scene, Chillingworth looks at them from the window, and there's this there's this conversation where Dimsdale is like, um, you know, do you know that man? You know, I hate that man. But Hester, of course, will is not going to reveal Chillingworth's identity to Dimsdale, just as she is not going to reveal Dimsdale to Chillingworth or anybody in the town. Um, and so this is one of the most powerful chapters um, because of the meteor. Um, and the meteor, when it comes down, it, like, makes this streaking... Um, symbol and the town thinks that it's an A for angel because this is the evening um, that the governor dies and he's on his deathbed and Dimsdale sees it as the A he never wore. So um, Hawthorne was a master at kind of psychological realism so we see Dimsdale's sudden mood changes and self-condemnation near insanity um, and then his subconscious expression of suppressed desire. So here you can see you really see this artful construction of the psychology of how Dimsdale um, has gotten to this point. And also, um, for those of you who are familiar with Peter, um, this refusal that he has to publicly, um, to be in public and like acknowledge what he's done, um, this is similar to Peter's first two denials of Christ. Um, but perhaps Dimsdale, like Peter, will have a third opportunity to confess himself. So um, that kind of gives you a recap of the significant things from chapters 9 through 12. Um, so as we move forward, um, I want you to make some predictions. What will Chillingworth do now that he has basically confirmed in multiple ways that Dimsdale is the father of Hester's baby? You know, he's seen the A. Um, he saw them all. The, he saw them outside. He just like really knows now. So what is he going to do? Um, and thanks for watching.